Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our City of Prescott virtual town hall meeting. It's been a few weeks since we've been on one of these town halls. Uh, this town hall is really directed for businesses that are reopening, particularly bars and gyms. Uh, the governor came out with new guidelines earlier this week, and we felt like it would be important to take some time to uh, dig into these guidelines to better understand uh, what those metrics are for reopening and the protocols and guidelines for uh, reopening. So uh, we have some different speakers today. Uh, and I also want to recognize city staff for working on these virtual town hall meetings. I want to thank Amy Schwal, who's here with us uh, today hosting. I appreciate her efforts. Also, we have American Sign Language uh, interpreters Jasmine and Tara. So thank you all for uh, your work interpreting today. Uh, our host will provide some background and information for today's call. Amy. Thank you, Mayor. Here are some ground rules for today's meeting, which I would like to cover. First, all participants are muted upon entry, and I will keep you muted throughout the duration of the call. Only speakers or panelists will be unmuted when I announce them to speak or answer questions. Once the speakers are finished, we will open up for a Q&A. To ask a question, raise your hand on the screen using the icon and the host, me, will call your name and unmute you. If you are calling in on a telephone, please press star nine to raise your hand. We ask that you not use your video option to prevent bandwidth issues. Documents shared by the speakers will be shown on the screen during their presentations. This meeting will be recorded as a video, which will be posted later today on the City of Prescott's COVID-19 page, along with the documents and important contact information. We are going to try to get through all the questions. However, if we miss you, you will have the opportunity to send an email to city staff and they will promptly reply to your question. That email address is communications at prescott-az.gov. In order to see the ASL interpreters, please select gallery view from your top options, then move the vertical slider bar to the left between the screen share and the video screens in order to make the interpreters appear on your screen. And back to you, Mayor. All right, thank you so much, Amy. Appreciate those details. I think we're all learning how to navigate uh, Zoom better every day. Unfortunately, hopefully we'll be together soon. Uh, before we get to our speakers, I want to just talk to our businesses a little bit who are here on the town hall today. And we just want to let you know that we really value uh, you and our city. We, we understand it's important that we help you through this difficult time. We do not want to lose bars or gyms who've been hit some of the hardest here in our city. And, and we understand that. And so uh, we're grateful for some new guidelines that allow some of you to begin reopening and, and we want to bring clarity around that. Uh, but just know that we're doing everything we can every day here and, and you are always in our thoughts. We want to make sure that, that we get you open successfully and as soon as we can. Uh, today we have Leslie Horton from Yepi County Community Health Services to speak about the numbers and give us some idea of what, uh, where we're headed. Uh, we also invited a representative from NACOG to talk about programs they have to help businesses bring workers back when the time comes. And finally, we have Sherry Heine from the Prescott Chamber to speak about the Save Our Bars campaign that just started uh, this week and I understand has already had a lot of success raising money for our bars. Uh, we also have additional resource persons on the call today uh, who will be available uh, towards the end for the Q&A. Uh, City Manager Michael Lamar will be with us, City Attorney John Palladini, and MJ Smith with the Prescott Downtown Partnership. So let's get started with our speakers. Uh, we're going to start with Leslie Horton, Director of Yepi County Community Health Services. Uh, Leslie, thanks uh, for being on the town hall today, and thanks for all you do uh, every day for our county, and especially for the City of Prescott. So uh, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I have gotten some good news this week, and I hope that it'll have a positive impact on your businesses and uh, how you run them, but I also want to explain because there are some uh, pretty extreme rules around some of the changes that are being rolled out. Now, 
uh, one thing that's changed this week is that the state has put out there some metrics um, for schools and for businesses. And so it's important to understand these metrics. And I'm kind of going to go through those metrics, explain them to you, uh, but also explain where we lie within those metrics and, uh, and making sure that you understand who can open, who should remain closed at this point in time. And, uh, and so we will uh, be open to questions as well if there's any confusion after I've talked. And so I've got some slides and I'm not sure if those are gonna come up quite yet. I can't see them from where I'm at, but. You see if I can share, oh, let me see if I can do this. Okay. All right, there we go. Thank you very much. So the benchmarks, uh, the three benchmarks that the state has chosen to uh, really guide our reopening process in our communities are uh, these three things. So they're cases. Uh, first and foremost, uh, cases, the number per 100,000 that we should be looking towards uh, right now and going forward. And so, so far, within these benchmarks, uh, we're doing very well, but we're looking at cases per 100,000. Uh, and right now we fall within that. I'll show you where we stand in just a minute. Percent positivity. Uh, as of today, our percent positivity daily this week has been right around 5.5%. But there's a lag time in the data. So when I show you where we stand right now with positivity rate and wanting to be under, um, 7% positivity rate, or in some cases for some establishments, it's a 3% positivity rate. Uh, there's a lag time there. So what the data that we'll be looking at today is gonna to be from July 26th, uh, the week of July 26th. And then COVID-like illness, and that's how many people are hospitalized currently. They wanna see less than 10% 10, 10 of people hospitalized being hospitalized for COVID-like illness. So. In hospitals like ours, they're testing readily for COVID, uh, but some people present with COVID-like symptoms, and those are counted as well sometimes until a negative test comes back. And so um, we can go on to that next slide, and I can then explain kind of where we stand currently within these benchmarks. Now, I'm very proud to say that Yavapai County is one of only two counties in the state that fall within a moderate level of community spread. So I guess I should explain that. There's three levels that you can fall into. One is substantial spread. That's where 13 of the 15 counties are currently. Moderate spread is where we're at, and I'll explain that. And then minimal spread is where you have barely any cases. We were in minimal spread for a very long time in our county um, between about March, April, and May, and we had about zero to five cases a day. There was a very few hospitalizations and um, our percent positivity was between zero and two percent generally um, in people who are tested. So uh, so cases per 100,000 right now in Yavapai County, we are at about 66 per 100,000. I don't know that slide didn't capture that number, but that's where we're at is about 66 per 100,000 and they take a seven day average of cases that we're having per day. Um, on the weeks prior to this one, we were averaging about 30 cases a day. And so they take that 30 times that by seven, and that's where our um, cases per day come out. We've got about 240,000 residents in Yavapai County. So we're looking at that number. We're pretty far below the moderate level for that. Um, when we get down to 10, cases per 100,000, that would be about 24 cases a day uh, on, on a regular basis, then we can fall into the moderate category. Percent positivity, we also fall into moderate. And um, on July 26th, that week, we were averaging about 6.4% positivity. And that's how many positive tests we get out of all of those tested. So today, um, I was looking at that marker, and that's what I had mentioned earlier, we're about 5.6% today. And so we've continued to see a downward trend since July 7th, which is marked as our peak in cases in Yavapai County. Um, that was the day we saw the most cases, and, um, and it's been 
going downhill ever since, which is a good thing in this case. But we should be on average, um, by the time that the data catches up on ADHS website, we're still right up above that 5% marker, which is kind of bringing us down below into that minimal area. But we're still a little ways away from that 3% marker, which is a threshold they've set for bars that don't serve any food or nightclubs. And so um, that percent positivity, though, is going in a great direction. And then hospitalizations, we've seen a dramatic decrease in hospitalizations over the last several weeks. And again, pretty much since that week of right after the 4th of July weekend, uh, we had our, and during 4th of July weekend, we had our peak of hospitalizations as well. And currently we're falling into a moderate level of COVID-like illness in the hospitals. About 5.1% of our hospitalizations currently are COVID related. And so that's really good news for all of us as we look to reopen. Uh, there were two counties, La Paz and Yavapai that fell into this moderate category as of this week and last week. Um, however, I did hear yesterday that La Paz has bumped right back up into the substantial spread category, which is not good news for them. They do look at this as a two-week average, so they may be able to pull themselves back down out of that category, but um, it looks like from what I'm seeing and the trends that I'm seeing, we will maintain this moderate category for a little while here, and that's a good thing. Um, I want to make sure that as we proceed, that we do it with caution. Um, I want to get everyone open and I fully understand the need to get our businesses operating. Um, and yet I do rely on all of you as business owners to make sure that you're doing your part and following the instructions that the state gives or that we give locally and making sure that we don't see a huge increase in cases. We've got a couple things playing against us and one of those is many of the schools looking to reopen that will convene more people. It could lead to more cases over time, but also if we're opening some of those higher risk businesses, um, gyms, bars, and other things, there could be a little bit more spread than we've seen before. We're in a pretty good place right now, but we could easily bump right back out of this category and into substantial, and I don't want to see that. I want to make sure that once we're reopening that we can maintain that and that we can stay open. So I think I can go on to the next slide, please. So that brings me to requirements. And um, gyms are able to open at this point in time. Gyms do have to fill an attestation form, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, the state has put out recommendations that once we're in that moderate spread level, gyms can reopen, but there's a lot of rules there. And I'll go over those rules in a minute. Um, and then there is the bars. And so I learned a lot this week in terms of what bars are able to do. Prior to this new guidance and the new set of metrics, a bar had to have 50% or more of their revenue from food, our series 12 license, in order to um, operate. And they had to operate in a restaurant style with 50% capacity and all of the same rules as a restaurant. Now, as of this week, they have changed that guidance to allow for some wiggle room. And it's not for everybody, but it will help in our circumstances. And I was able to walk a bar through this process yesterday and it actually was successful. So with the new attestation form that you would have to fill out on the ADHS website, a bar can um, file an attestation form if they serve some sort of food. They have to be permitted for it. So under our environmental health permitting process, we have the bars that are permitted just as bars, drinks only. And then there's ones that are permitted to have bar food. And so that is uh, one caveat now is that if you're permitted to serve drinks and that's your primary revenue, but you serve some sort of food, we can actually put you through this process, especially those series six licenses that didn't otherwise have food um, or not substantial amounts of food associated with them. But in that, we do have to make sure that you're set up as a restaurant style service. And so that's kind of the big change. You have to, and in their, the verbiage, they say you convert to a restaurant style. 
And so what that means is there's a number of things you have to do. There's, um, there's table seating. So we can't have people convening at the bar. Um, you do have to require masks upon entry, like a restaurant, you're supposed to require masks upon entry and until people are seated and um, drinking or eating. There is uh, no dancing, no karaoke, no parlor games. Um, and like I've said, there's no fun, but we can still have fun without those other things. Um, I just, I know that the state is being overly careful with what they'll allow us to do. So if you have those things set up, um, you can put tables on the dance floors, you can um, cover up pool tables and do other things to make sure that people aren't tempted to um, go out and dance. But there's, there's other rules around this and those are, um, there should be a hostess that's seating people that you shouldn't have. I think I mentioned groups larger than 10. People shouldn't convene at the bar. You can have people sitting at the bar, but you can't have big groups um, standing around or convening. And, um, and I think there's a few other things that I haven't mentioned, but there is a long list of the requirements on the Arizona Department of Health Services website. And there is, um, it's called COVID-19 Guidance for Businesses, and it came out August 10th. And so I do recommend if you're a bar and you're considering uh, wanting to reopen, which I know many of you are have just been waiting to do this, that you look at those that guidance and make sure that you know you can fulfill all of the requirements. And so, I'm trying to get through here and look at what the guidance for the gyms is. Um, first, before I find that, I can talk about the attestation form. So the attestation form is found on the Arizona Department of Health Services website. And it's only for businesses who were closed up till now. Uh, many of you have already gone on and, uh, and applied. As long as you meet the criteria of a bar with food service, then, or dine-in services, you can go ahead and apply. And what you'll get is generally a bounce back email that gives you an, an approval because we are in a county with moderate spread. And so it'll look at which county you're in and make sure that you meet the requirements. The only businesses still closed are the nightclubs or the bars that do not uh, convert to dine-in services. So keep that in mind. If you put in that category, you're gonna get kicked out. But we also, um, as a health department, we wanna work with you and make sure that if you don't qualify and you want to, that maybe we can work within your permits or um, look at how you're permitted and try to help you walk through this process. So please reach out to our environmental health office at the County Community Health Services, or um, you can reach out to me and we'll walk you through the process and make sure that you can, um, you can qualify or you know, find out if there's changes you need to make in order to qualify. So, let me see here. I was looking for those rules for gyms. So all gyms are allowed to open right now, um, but there are some pretty strict rules around gyms. And um, sorry, this printed out a little funky. So with gyms, there is a 25% capacity rate that you have to maintain. So if you normally would have 100 people in your gym, you need to limit that to 25% um, to until we get into that minimal spread category or the benchmark. And so this is indoor gyms and fitness centers. So that's all of you out there that have a gym, a yoga studio, uh, anything that would qualify to, as a fitness uh, setting. Now you can still hold classes outdoors. I absolutely recommend that if you have the space and the ability, uh, please go ahead and hold some classes outdoors and um, it's a little bit easier that way. There's no mask requirement outdoors, but indoors there is. And so one of the things that you're going to have to look at if you have uh, a gym is that you're going to have to start requiring masks. They do recommend that you recommend to your patrons to bring their own water bottle to um, possibly shut down water fountains or com like communal um, areas of the gym where people might spread germs. Really encourage hand washing, sanitization, all of those things. And that really goes for all businesses right now. 
gyms have a little bit more risk to them just because of um, people breathing a little harder while they work out as well as sweat and other things that can um, create a more humid environment and more uh, capacity for this virus to spread. But, uh, you know, the gyms, I'm excited to hear that they can open um, as well as the bars, but, you know, if they have questions, please come uh, call the health department, call my staff, myself, and um, I'm happy to walk through what you need to do in order to reopen. Like I mentioned before, that whole list of requirements is on the ADHS website in that um, in that packet that they have posted for reopening of businesses and guidance for businesses. So uh, I think that that is all I'm going to share today, but I'm happy to answer questions based on that too. Are we going to wait for questions till the end or no? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Leslie, thank you. Really appreciate the help uh, interpreting what the state is giving everyone in terms of reopening. It's not always easy to navigate or to understand the different metrics. And I know everyone wants to to open as soon as possible. Like you say, uh, we want to do it safely. And I know that they want to play within the rules. And sometimes it's hard to understand what all these rules and guidelines mean for each different business. I uh, also want to thank you just for your availability. You're always ready to, to jump in and help us like with this virtual town hall. Uh, we contacted you a few days ago and I really appreciate you uh, being willing to do the hard work to understand all this information and then get it out to our businesses today. So jot your questions down for Leslie. I'm sure that you have many um, specific questions to your business. She'd be happy to answer those. It's hard to get all of the information out in every different scenario. So please uh, prepare your questions for her specifically to your business. All right, let's move on to our next speaker, Alex Gabaldon with NACOG. Uh, Alex has a presentation, I believe, that will get up on the screen for us here with Amy's help. Uh, Alex, uh, welcome to the town hall. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Alex, we're with, and it looks like she's on the phone. Can you he's can you hear me? Phone. I'm sorry. Uh, That's okay. Can Alex, you hear me, Mayor? Can you hear me? I am talking. Okay. Let's see. Great. Okay. Can Alex, you hear me? Alex, take it away. Okay. Great. I'm with Northern Arizona Council of Governments. I want to talk about uh, a little bit of overview. We are with the economic workforce development. We have a lot more things we do. We help with Head Start and Area 18 on Aging, and we help in the community with uh, helping people get their rent and um, more, and uh, utilities paid for, things like that. But this focus is economic development. We we um, our mission is to help build uh, de department uh, developmental partnerships. We are a grant through the U.S. Department of Labor, and um, we work with the Yavapai County Board of Supervisors to administer the workforce development. Basically, we, do, we have a grant, federal grant, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and what it does is it allows us to help people get jobs and training for jobs, and it's free because we've all paid into our taxes. It went to the federal government. It came back and filtered back to us. So it's a matter of, I always say to people, the services aren't free because it takes paperwork and time and filling out things, but it will not cost you anything other than that. So these are good programs. Um, we're a one-stop uh, place where you can come and get, we've helped people during this time with the unemployment um, filing. We've helped people with just call, um, talking to them on the phone during the stressful times of um, seeking employment the, or unemployment benefits. So we've been here the whole time, all of us program specialists, case managers, we've been here the whole time helping clients. We still help clients one-on-one. -on -one. They come to our office, we wear masks, we were safe, six feet distancing. We do all the precautionary things to continue to help. Um, again, what is the Workforce Development Board? It's a board that meets and we decide um, what is good for the community, along with the Board of Supervisors, as far as um, what the community needs. We want to provide jobs that are in demand, not just, um, I always make the joke that we do not put people in 
foam booth construction. And then the young people I work with ask what's a foam booth. So things like that. We do things in demand. We help people in, um, I've helped people recently get their CNA for nursing on the way to be an RN. Also CDL truck driving, construction, um, welding, things like that. Things in demand that we need. Um, so we also uh, monitor what's going on out there as far as um, workforce and what's happening in the community, things like that. So the big focus, uh, next slide please, would be um, dislocated worker services. Basically, I'm going to say uh, these four bullet points and everything, right on these, all, because of COVID-19, everybody is, is dislocated in some capacity, either full unemployment or they've just had less hours um, or things dr dramatically changed. We have companies that have downsized and they've laid people off um, just to survive. So these are the bullet points. Unemployment or lost their job through no fault of their own. Received layoff notice, may not return to previous employment. Been separated from their income. Um, some people have left the home and it's gone from two incomes to one. And some people have been furloughed. They've been, uh, we've had some companies we work with where they furloughed all their people and then they slowly brought them back. Um, so it's been kind of uh, good helping them and monitoring them. Other services we provide, people come in, we give basic orientation of what we do. Then we assist them with if they need unemployment or to register for unemployment, we help them with that. We also help them with resumes. Um, I had a client recently came in and they needed their resume looked at. So we look at that, we help them um, with their resume design, also job referrals, we help with that. We contact the community and find out what, again, we have a list, ongoing list of COVID-19 employees employers who are out there seeking employees like right away of course the um, people needed to get food into the um, stores so we had those we had other companies and so we keep an ongoing list of companies so we can tell people what who's opening we also assist the employers in finding people who would fill those spots so it's a two-way street so we can help um, them meet we also, here at NACOG, we've been doing curbside eligibility. It's pretty interesting. There's one person, a couple people now, who have, when COVID first started, you weren't sure, so it was a lot of it dropping in the mailbox, going back and forth, doing the paperwork, getting it done through email, through scanning, through whatever, and never meeting in person, which isn't our normal thing because we want to make um, personal contact with people. But it was the best we could do. and. I can say I've got somebody in school and out of school and they're employed uh, in a really good job and they're happy all without ever meeting them except just talking on the phone and things like that. So we can do that. We've been, but we've been opening up to people coming in, making appointments and we have um, distancing appointments or everybody's wearing a mask and we're being very safe and it's been successful getting people into different programs. Um, and then I just want to give some links to how to stay connected. We have, a, again, dislocated worker um, and financial management links at NACOG. We also have ongoing career assessments. These are really interesting assessments you can take. It's on the next slide, sorry. And it's an assessment. You can go on there and kind of see what you're at, where your skill levels are at, what's the next um, so there's a 60 question thing to find out. You kind of already know, but this kind of tells you where you're at as far as um, your skill assessments and things like that. There's allison.com, which we use. There's a great free training on there to see what type of, um, if you have certain skills you want to upgrade, there's things like that. And um, plenty of job search at Arizona Job Connection. And um, other business links are on here that we want to give you. And again, you can always contact NACOG at 778-1422, and we'll get you started on helping you with your new career or career training 
that would be helping you succeed. So again, I'm just proud to be part of NACOG in the sense that we've been here the whole time, not, you know, not in the same capacity, but we've adapted like businesses have all had to adapt to be able to serve our community. So that is it. Hey, Alex, thank you so much for that presentation. We really appreciate what sure. NACOG does here in our city, helping our businesses. And it's, it's nice to know that uh, you guys are there with all these resources. You've adapted to help keep people safe and, and really appreciate the support that you bring to our businesses. And if you have questions for Alex, please uh, prepare those questions and uh, we'll get to those here in our Q&A in just a minute. Thanks again, Alex. Sure, thank you. All right, last speaker we have today is Sherry Heine uh, with the Save Our Bars campaign, which Sherry started here, uh, Prescott Chamber of Commerce Foundation this week. Sherry, thank you so much for supporting uh, all of our businesses, but especially this week, really focusing on our bars to try to figure out how to really get behind them and support them uh, with this campaign. So Sherry, uh, you're, you're welcome to get started. Well, thank you, Mayor. Greatly appreciate your leadership. And I just want to echo to everyone uh, what you said in your beginning comments that we, the, the city, the chamber, the Prescott Downtown Partnership and the health department, I think we've had daily, weekly, hourly conversations uh, about all of our businesses and we, we care about everyone. And, you know, two weeks ago, we had a meeting about, we knew that gyms and bars were going to be our last businesses that are here opening right now. So we've, we've been very concerned about that and watching that and working with the governor's office. And, uh, you know, I just want to say that uh, we, we know that there are so many businesses struggling, but we really identified that bars was going to have the toughest time opening up. We knew gyms were already on their way to being able to open especially after the, the, the lawsuit that, that they won. But we knew bars are going to have a, 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 a huge hurdle. And many of them are suffering, and, that, and they are our history. Whiskey Row is what Prescott is famous for. Uh, we can't sit back and let that happen. So the Prescott Chamber Foundation has been, uh, involved, has been around since 2006, it is involved in partnering with the Prescott Downtown Partnership as it relates to the Courthouse Plaza, but it has the capacity as a 501c3 to uh, get involved in many different areas. And so that is why we created, we had many people asking, what can we do, what can we do? And this 501c3 opportunity uh, allows us to be able to create the campaign where people can help uh, the bars in this case, but and uh, also get a tax write-off. And uh, our goal is to be able to give each of our bars that cannot open um, at least $10,000 grant to help them get by until we can get them open. And I know Leslie's working really hard on that. So um, I just want to say that we're very proud of it. I think uh, in the first, in the day and a half that we've uh, started it we're already over the ten thousand dollar mark we've got a lot of people making pledges and uh actually at 12 noon we're going to be meeting with the bars and distributors and talking about ways that um we can continue to grow this and really help everyone out and i have to say after we launched the campaign the bars have been so thankful that once they get on their feet they've already mentioned to me that they want to try to help others as well. So this has become that silver lining, I think, that we all need. We are community here, and uh, we need to take care of each other. And I think this is just a great example of, uh, I'm very proud to be able to launch this and to be able to help, and we're hopeful that we can help others as well. Sherry, thank you so much uh, for getting this started. Um, how can people find the link here? Is this on the Chamber website or is there a different website? Yeah, you can go to prescott.org and it's right on the front page and uh, you can click on there. You can donate right online or you can fill out a form and uh, send it into the Chamber as well. 
That's excellent. Well, my wife and I will be making a generous donation to this campaign. And, you know, the bars will be back and they will help others. But I must say, I feel like they've always been there for us. And that's why it's so important for us to be there for them now. When something happens like uh, the Granite Mountain Hot Shots, I, I know this is a group of businesses along with our other businesses that always steps up and gives and helps in times of need. And so um, I'm very uh, hopeful that uh, all of our folks here in town will help our businesses with this campaign. So thank you so much, Sherry, for all that you do for all of our businesses, but especially on the Save Our Bars campaign. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to q and A. I I believe this is really one of the more important parts of this whole, whole town hall is we want to get everyone involved in the conversation. We wanna hear your concerns, your questions, uh, and really hopefully bring some very uh, uh, precise information for your business that really will help you reopen. That's what this is all about. So I'm gonna let Amy uh, talk a little bit about how to raise your hand, how to get uh, your question to us so that we can answer those. Keep in mind that uh, beyond uh, Leslie and Alex and Sherry, we also have Michael Lamar, John Palladini, and MJ Smith with the Prescott Downtown Partnership on the call to help uh, answer your questions. And it's helpful if you can let us know exactly who uh, you would like to direct your question to. So I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, we ask that you please choose the raise your hand icon on your screen. If you're calling in by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. We request that you keep your questions concise and under one minute to allow for as many questions as possible. Once your hand is raised, I will call your name and ask you to unmute yourself before you speak. I see that there are already two questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one I see is from, uh, oh, sorry, rather, is for Leslie. Leslie, can a bar make arrangements with a restaurant for food delivery to the bar rather than prepare the food on site? The answer to that is yes. Uh, just this morning when I was talking to our environmental health folks, uh, that was a suggestion is to either find a way to bring in food trucks that could serve, provide some food service, outdoors that people could dine in or cater or otherwise have food prepared and brought in. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it can be very minor foods, um, breads and other, you know, very low risk uh, foods that people can serve. But you can also do more substantial partnership and bring in food trucks or other things that could serve uh, that need. And so as I suggested earlier, I think it would be good to Give us a call, um, give our environmental health office a call or uh, myself and we'll try to figure out what might work and you can kind of run some ideas by us and we're open to working with you. So um, bring us your ideas. The next question that was typed in earlier uh, asks Leslie again, if there is only one staff member working, can they also attend to the seating? In small bars, only one staff member is there at times, or would we need to add an additional worker? Absolutely, I think that, you know, you've got to work within what you have available to you. We're not gonna, you know, at this point in time, especially ask you to hire additional people to suit these requirements. You could easily have someone manning the bar that also helps to direct people to tables and uh, you know, look through that list of requirements and see how within your own staff that you can make that work. But those were suggestions when I brought this to the state yesterday is to have a hostess, have you know, people sat at tables so that they're not just going straight to the bar and convening and things like that. Um, it's gonna be an adjustment just for the public to understand why these changes are in place. And so having you know, some good signage if you don't have a lot of staff and making sure that your rules are posted, but also that you have somebody able to kind of meet people at or near the door and direct them as to where they should go when they enter the establishment would be helpful. All right, Josh McCrower. 
I have a couple questions, if that's all right. Um, so for those bars that can't, that can partner with either a food truck or a restaurant, are hey, they Josh, a, Josh yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I did not have, we did not have our volume up when you got started. Could you start over again, please? No problem. So I have a couple of questions for those uh, bars that don't have on-site kitchens, so are unable to convert their license to a food type license from a drinking license, but could partner with either a food truck or a restaurant, would that still be okay to reopen? Yes. So, and that's where I was saying, I think that it would be good to talk with our environmental health office on what that would look like. But that is an absolute option at this point. We, uh, we want to make sure that we leave that flexible, knowing that most bars don't have a big kitchen in order to prepare foods. And, um, and it can be very simple foods, too. Uh, it can be things that are, you know, very easy to serve and easy to, um, to maintain uh, with, or preserve without having it spoil. But you can also have partner with some food trucks or other agencies that can bring in uh, food that's already prepared. And I think that's a great idea. Okay, so if we have one food truck that potentially partners with the four bars that are on Whiskey Row, um, that would suffice for all of us to, to ensure that we don't have four food trucks back there that are super slow and then don't want to stay committed to us. Yeah, I think that would be smart. It is, sorry, we have an echo. I think it would be a good idea is to partner maybe with a food truck or a few, you know, have different ones, different days or something and, and be able to utilize those across Whiskey Row if that is what can work. Okay, wonderful. Um, and then, you know, how long are these requirements going to last for, you know, that we can't operate as a bar? I, I mean, I, I appreciate all of your efforts, especially you guys, you know, have gone above and beyond, um, you know, but let's be real here. I'm not a restaurant. I'm not going to make money operating as a restaurant. I hopefully won't lose money and be able to pay the bills or lose my personal house over this at this point. But, you know, how long is this going to last? Yeah, I can definitely empathize with you. And I'm, I apologize for, you know, some of the parameters that we haven't had a lot of control over on a local level. And that's where I know I've been working really hard with Greg and others who are trying our best to really support you and through this and try to troubleshoot ways. I think um, we're all willing to work with you and try to see it um, benefit you in the best way possible for your business and get back open. But the state does kind of have the reins in this um, situation and they have set these parameters and we you know it's in our best interest to follow the parameters the next step and the next um, metric that we would have to meet is that um, minimal spread and for bars if you're not serving food that's a three percent positivity rate of cases and testing and so and that's 10 out of actually let me make sure I'm saying this right for bars we would have to meet the positivity rate of 3%, which we're at 5.5 today. There's gonna to be a delay time in the lag time of the data. So we're not at 3% quite yet. We can get there as long as we don't see any spikes in cases and um, increases in overall cases. But right now being in that moderate category before we can let you just operate as a bar, we have to be at 3% positivity rate of cases. And uh, like I said, we were there for quite some time early in the pandemic, and it's just taking more time to get back down to that. Because once this virus is here, it does take a lot of mitigation strategies to get those numbers back down to a 3% positivity. But we're working there. And, and I would say back in July, we were at 10% for a little while on a daily average. Now we're down to 5.5%. So if we keep working at it, do our best with these parameters now, we can get back to business the way that you want to run your business. Okay, and my last question would be, you know, um, as a bar, we're normally open till 2 a.m. 
So do the, the food trucks or food have to be available all hours of operation? That's a very good question. I might have to follow up with an answer on that one. That was, you're the first person that's posed that question and um, I will try to find out. And I think that, you know, as long as during the majority of your hours that you're serving food, there's a lot of restaurants that make a call that say, you know, we're stopping food service at this point in time and then you close your doors at a certain point in time. So I'll find out though and try to get back to you on that one. Thank you. Hey, Josh, uh, thanks for the call. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, you know, the four bars that we have there on Whiskey Row are very important to us. All of our bars are, of course, but um, if there are any technical needs that you have with having a food truck uh, on Whiskey Row or whatever those things might be, please reach out to John Heine here at City Hall. Uh, we want to do everything we can from the city's side of things to uh, make sure that we can help you accommodate any of these special needs that you guys have as you start to look to reopen. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. We really appreciate that. All right. Uh, we'll move on. Nobody else? Uh, no other questions out there at this point. Um, John, anything else uh, that we need to, to cover that you think we've missed or Leslie? Uh, just let everybody know that the links, the phone numbers and everything will be posted um, on the city's website following this. All right. Looks like we do have one more question, but before we do that, um, John was just mentioning that uh, the link for this virtual town hall. This will this has been recorded and the links for this town hall will be available on our website. Uh, some social media as well, possibly, yes. John. Yeah, uh, a lot of good information here, as you know, you might want to share it with those that maybe do similar business as you and they weren't on this town hall uh, to get their questions answered. So, Amy, what do you have for a question? Thank you. Next, I have Matt Brassard. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. Thank you, Mayor and Leslie, for having this today. Um, really appreciate all the great info. I did have one quick question as far as these guidelines for you, Leslie. These are across the board for restaurants and bars, correct? For, for restaurants that have remained open, these, these guidelines are in effect. And are all of the restaurants aware of these guidelines? And if not, do you have a messaging campaign to get this out to the restaurants that, you know, we've seen some that are doing karaoke and some that do have dancing and all that. And also does this apply to like places like coffee houses and, and all that? Yeah, that is a good question. And we have been messaging this out to bars and restaurants as much as possible. Now restaurants um, do have to fall under the same rules of, you know, they're supposed to be not karaoke, they're supposed to be not dancing, um, and other things that really convene people in a way that would put them in kind of a group atmosphere. And so they should know that. We're also, as we send our environmental health inspectors out, they should be educated on the rules. I think the difficulty we run into is that the, the you know, without eyes on all the time, um, we are very limited in our staffing. And so we, you know, work to educate and enforce these rules, but the education is a little bit stronger right now than the enforcement because we really want to work with everybody to make sure that you can run your business um, and be successful. But we are, if we hear about those things, I ask that people call our office because we do follow up on a complaint basis. If we haven't been in the establishment and see those things going on, we try to make sure that we're keeping a level playing field as much as possible and abiding by the rules, but also um, working within the rules to make sure people can run their businesses. So um, if there are certain ones that are violating and not creating that level playing field for the rest of you, uh, it would be good for us to know so that we can follow up with those. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and one more quick question just to clarify. Uh, you know, most of us bars do have what's called a drinking um, permit. Um, there are other bars that have eating establishment, you know, zero to 30, 31 to, uh, so with our drinking permit, would we have to get an additional permit to open? That's where I think a call to our office would be a really good idea. Um, in terms of the one that I walked through yesterday, 
it was, um, they had a drinking permit, but there was the opportunity then to serve minor foods within that. And so if we need to make adjustments to the permit or look at what you're permitted for, we should do that probably on an individual basis so that we can see what needs to happen in order to make this possible. Great. So go Thank ahead and reach so out much. to our office. Thank you. Next, we have questions from Russell Roberts. Russell, can you hear me? Go ahead. Russell? Russell, this is uh, Greg here. Can you hear me? Russell has also posed his questions in the chat, so I'll read them to you now. Oh. So first, upon my opening, I bought the bar a little over a year ago. I was told by the health department that I needed to be a safe serve manager, as I am a food establishment, as ice and condiments are food. Can you please speak to this? Does this mean I can open because ice is food? Like if ice is $4, the liquor and mix may be $1. Yes, that is one strange loophole to a lot of environmental health rules is that food is considered or ice is considered food. Uh, I do think that that's something that we should run through our environmental health office. Uh, my biggest concern in this is that I don't want to give someone a go ahead to say they can sell ice as food and then get you in trouble with your liquor licenses or the state health department. So I think that you know, like I mentioned, bring us your ideas um, at the to our environmental health office. Let's see what we can do. And I think that there's some there's far more flexibility in these current rules and where we stand in our moderate spread category that we can work with you and make sure that um, that we're following their rules, but also doing what works best for your businesses and um, minimizing the changes that you have to make in order to operate. So. Um, I think that's a great question. I can't give you a solid answer at this point on the ice, but um, maybe. So talk to our office and I'd be happy to help. I like the fact that you said you can't give a solid answer on ice. <laughs> Saw what you did there. Uh, good question, Russell. Um, and I appreciate Leslie wanting to make sure we're protecting our liquor licenses here without uh, jeopardizing those. If anyone uh, from the gyms, I'm assuming there's a few gym owners that are on here. If you guys have questions, we haven't really touched on the gym owners a lot or at all here in the Q&A. If you have any questions, please uh, let us know. Russell did have a second question and that was for the mayor. Does the offer for Whiskey Road food trucks apply to other bars as well? Right. So um, I guess my offer to those folks on Whiskey Row in terms of just helping accommodate where they park and how this is all going to work, that would be true anywhere, Russell. Uh, we want to we wanna be here helping uh, any of our bars if, if there's a need uh, from the city side of things with a food truck or, or accommodating, you know, some special circumstances around getting food uh, to your establishment, absolutely. Uh, we're here to help. So Russell, please again, reach out to John Heine here uh, in our office uh, or any bars for that matter. Uh, if you need help uh, from the city's uh, regula regulatory side of things uh, with those kinds of needs, absolutely. Next, we have a question from Robert Kolar. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Leslie, uh, my question is for you um, real quick. Um, are there any principal um, documents with the rules and stuff that we have po that we can have posted um, on a website? And if so, where, where might that we locate that? Yes, and we will repost these on our website. I don't know if you can see this in my camera. This is the okay. packet of information. It's called COVID-19 Guidance for Businesses. And it was published on August 10th. And 
um, you can reference that. That has most of the rules there, suggestions as well, and kind of goes over those benchmarks and the, and the categories that we're falling into. And then there's also a dashboard on the Arizona Department of Health Services website that we're gonna start trying to reflect on our website as well in terms of the categories of um, risk factors that we have and changes that we might see over time. And so I do recommend that people, especially as you venture into reopening, just to make sure you're doing everything um, by the book, is to go to the Arizona Department of Health Services website, look at that COVID-19 guidance for businesses, and then um, come to us with your questions that go beyond um, anything unanswered there. Okay, thank you so much. Just as a follow-up on that real quick, uh, we gotta navigate my volume here, sorry guys. Uh, we do also have the guidelines that Leslie just mentioned on our City of Prescott website uh, backslash COVID-19. So you can find those on the City of Prescott website. And then I've mentioned to reach out to John Heine a few different times. His email is listed here in the chat. If you want to pick that up from the chat box here, you can uh, email John that way. Okay. Uh, Amy? Okay. Next, we have a question. Is it mandatory to have COVID signs posted on entries and around the bar? signs like how to not spread, hand washing, et cetera, and where can you find them to be able to post? They are a strong suggestion, and I would suggest to post things that you can in order to cut down on um, a lot of questions, and the more you have posted, the less you have to repeat to people if they're violating the rules. Um, at least it's just, it's clear. Uh, we don't ask that you go excessive on the signage, but it's smart to have it posted either at the door or um, at the bar and to make sure that you are also reinforcing those rules through, you know, modeling that behavior. And, and so most people know what those rules are now, but as bars reopen, there's going to be some questions because you've been closed for a while. So I would say be clear with those rules. Um, there, they are on our website at yavapai.us slash CHS. We have a bunch of examples of signs that you can print and use yourself. Also, the Arizona Department of Health Services website has a whole bunch. And on ours, um, they're posted just under the blue dashboard that has all the um, numbers and metrics of today. There's a resources for reopening link that you can go to and that has all of that information as well as those signs. Our next question is regarding the fitness centers. What level of government or government agency is giving fitness centers legal advice or joining in the legal battle lawsuit for when a person wearing a mask passes out from exertion, hypocrisy, asphyxiation, et cetera, and gets hurt because the fitness center is following government guidelines? That's a very good question. I've worried about all of these things myself, working out with a mask on. And I, you know, I think that it's important to understand that there are loopholes to these rules and that if someone cannot wear a mask, uh, you can't force anyone to wear a mask if they have a health condition that requires that they don't or that makes it difficult to breathe. And so that's where some of those other rules really come into play, like the six feet, uh, physical distancing and others. Uh, here at a local level, we have little jurisdiction over gyms. We don't inspect you as a health department. Uh, and I absolutely hear the concerns. I didn't make these rules myself and probably would have not necessarily made a, a rule for mask wearing while working out, but that uh, is the as at a level higher than I. And so I would talk to the state health department um, and see if there's any way of looking into the legal ramifications of that. Otherwise, work within your own business model. And if there's um, individuals who say that they should not wear a mask because of breathing issues or other problems, I would work with them to just make sure that they understand the other rules and uphold them. And, uh, and that's up to you as a business. We won't be coming in and, and trying to enforce that rule. You know, Leslie, I think it's a good point. Uh, and I think it's really up to those gym and fitness owners to create the kind of environment in their gym with the right kind of communication 
where people all understand that not everybody can wear a mask and work out. You know, it, it, you know, some people can't wear a mask just in general. We know that. But then particularly, there's probably more people that can't wear a mask while working out because you're going to deplete your oxygen level. And I think if these owners can create the kind of environment where there's grace, understanding, you know, the realization that some of us can't work out and wear a mask, but we're following all the other guidelines. I think that's really important for our owners to, to keep that in mind and make sure that kind of environment is, is uh, in place. Yeah, and I agree. I think that that's where we're at here on a local level. Like I've said, I, I ask that everyone be careful and, and abide by the rules that are there. But within that, you know, you have to do what's best for your clientele, for your business as well, and making sure that you're abiding by these rules. If you cannot pick up one piece of the rule, like if there's people that can't wear masks, then accommodate in other ways. The sanitization, the physical distancing goes a long ways when you're talking about, you know, in a gym, you're breathing harder, you're um, exerting yourself more, which could spread your germs farther. But uh, for the most part, you know, if you can make sure that people who are seemingly unhealthy, coughing, sneezing, um, sick, are removed, that goes for gyms and bars. Um, from what I've seen with COVID, most people that are spreading this have some sort of symptoms, whether that be fever, shortness of breath, coughing, sneezing, or other things that you could possibly identify and ask them to leave, um, which I think is an important piece of this, is having the confidence to go up to someone who doesn't seem well and ask them to leave because that's where that spread is gonna be more um, apt to happen. And so if you've got somebody you know, who can't wear a mask, work with them. If you've got you know, someone who's obviously sick, you're gonna want them to have a mask on and you're gonna wanna ask them to leave um, as soon as possible. And there's a follow-up to that. What is the likelihood that this will create an ongoing, permanent, onerous, bureaucratic presence for fitness facilities? That is another very big question. But, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we don't regulate gyms on a local level. Uh, we do ask that you go by the honor system. I think that the biggest regulation of this is going to be probably from competition and other like businesses and, um, and people's willingness to support how you uphold these rules. There's gonna be the people that don't wanna deal with the rules. And then there's gonna people be the people that really ask you and demand that you uphold the rules that are there. And so that's where, you know, having that attestation form at your front door to let people know that you've gone through the process, that you know what's required, and that you are allowed to be open, but also to um, realize that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of rules right now, but on a local level, we don't regulate gyms. Uh, we wanna make sure that you know that those are things that we might call you if we get a lot of complaints and talk to you about what's going on, but we're not gonna come in and shut you down. We just ask that you go by the honor system, do your best, and help us keep this um, spread low because like I mentioned, if we start seeing big spikes in cases again, it could change the whole trajectory of this and um, at a state level, we could end up having to shut back down and I don't wanna see that at all. So do your part, do your best and I appreciate the help. And our next question is from first initial J Bendig. So the mask requirement kind of reminds me of, at least for bars, asking about a service animal. We're very limited on what we can ask and we kind of have to take their word for it. So how does that work for people that say, I can't wear a mask, what are we supposed to do with that? What can we ask legally and how should we work with that? That's a good question. And, you know, without going deep into their health conditions or what's happening, I would just take their word for it. Um, you know, if you start seeing that it's the majority of people you serve, you might get some other public that's upset that there isn't mask wearing. But if it's, you know, the minority, the people that really don't need to wear a mask or choose that that's absolutely not going to work for them, I don't think it's worth the argument. Um, and you know, you can accommodate people 
no matter what, or you can choose not to also. So that's a business decision. You can ask people if they choose not to wear a mask that you don't provide them a service um, or allow them inside, but that's up to the individual business. Like I said, we're not gonna regulate that and I wouldn't go down um, too deep into the weeds with questioning why someone can't wear a mask at this point. My main concern is that it's probably going to catch on with regulars out of town. Oh, I can't wear a mask. And then that's going to be kind of the standard that develops as far as clientele goes. And don't really know how to mitigate that. Yeah, so far that's not necessarily what we're seeing, but it could, I mean, we could get there and hopefully, you know, what I hope that we continue to see this downward trajectory of cases and that it won't be so much of a concern, um, but you can make your own business decisions too. And that's where we do ask, especially in a city here where we have no mask mandate, it's up to each business to decide what they're gonna allow and what they're not going to allow within their businesses. And so, you know, there are these rules, there's these guidance um, and suggestions, but you know, it is really up to each business as to how they're gonna handle that. And if you're gonna allow those people uh, to come in and uh, and partake in your uh, what you have to offer or if you're going to not allow it or if you start seeing trends you know reinforcing your rules a little bit more um, strongly so there are a lot of businesses right now who will not let you in if you don't have a mask okay thank you Leslie we have a question now from Josh Macrower so just to clarify, once the uh, customer is at their table or chair, they are not required to have a mask on in between taking sips out of a drink or taking bites out of their food. I mean, the, the, com the uh, casino that makes is, you. That <laughs> is uh, clarified well. So I think that, you know, actually I read it in the guidance that they think someone should have the mask on right up until they're taking a bite or taking a drink. Um, I don't know what the difference there is between having the mask on until you're seated. And then at that point, you know, if you're taking it off, you're taking it off. And, um, and I, you know, I think that that's one of those rules that if it, as a business you want to uphold that they have to put that mask on every time they're not eating or drinking, that's up to you. I would probably suggest that you not get into that one either. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, really good questions. I want to thank everybody for uh, calling in and, and asking great questions. Uh, as you can tell, we're all here to help. Uh, the city, the, the county health department, the chamber, the PDP. Uh, we want to see everybody be successful and get reopened and, and keep everyone safe. So again, thanks to all of our speakers today and the, and the staff that were on hand to help uh, with any questions. Uh, I want to thank our businesses out there for your resilience and your patience and, uh, you know, weathering this storm. And, and we're hopeful that we're seeing uh, the end of this, uh, hopefully, as we begin to see uh, bars and gyms, especially right now, uh, reopen. Uh, again, just a reminder, the video will be posted on the City of Prescott website, uh, along with any of the documents or presentations that were shared today. Well, I want to wish everybody a great weekend. Uh, get outside, stay healthy, and uh, enjoy yourselves. Rest, relax, and connect with friends and family. Have a great weekend. Thank you.